Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. This is Energy in America at three o'clock every other Wednesday. And we have this show with Lou Pugliarisi. He's, with, he's the president of EPRINC, Energy Policy Research uh, Organization in Washington, DC. And he is joining us from Washington, DC, which is very special because t today is a very, hmm, what do we call it, federal government day. We've had the results of the runoffs in Georgia um, and we've had a breach of the Capitol building for the first time since 1812, make that 1814, part of the 1812 war, he told me. Uh, Lou, welcome back to your show. Nice to be here, Jay. And you know, the really title this evening is to understand how the uh, Georgia Senate elections, which ties the Senate, but actually effectively gives the Democrats control of the Senate, uh, what it's going to do to energy and environment policy over the next uh, few years. But before we talk about that, the sort of mundane stuff, uh, we did have a little activity in Washington today. You know, every time someone is upset, they seem to want to come to my town and tear up the lawns and protest and do things. And so today, as you pointed out, we had a breach of the Capitol, really unusual because it's a fairly well fortified or a uh, building. And this was the, in fact, if you go on the internet, you can see some character in Nancy Pelosi's office with his feet up on the table. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Perfect, yeah. And you know, one of the things is, and today I think, although uh, President Trump, Trump did give a speech today and he has been complaining uh, incessantly that the election was stolen from him. Actually, he might have some, some uh, merit that the election was quote unfair, but all elections are unfair. You know, both sides engage in some shenanigans. Uh, the press is sometimes uh, very uh, inequitable in the way they distribute its criticism and praise. But no one can doubt he brought out most of this stuff himself. And in fact, I think uh, one of the interesting things about the Georgia elections is I believe that uh, it has it will free the Republican Party from Trump as a kingmaker. He has personally, he is personally responsible for losing these Senate races in the way he comported himself, in my opinion. And so before we talk about what this all means to energy and environment policy, I think it's, it's necessary to go back and look a little bit at history and see what lessons there are in these kinds of things. And you know, in January of 1961, Vice President Richard Nixon had just lost a very tough election to Senator John Kennedy. And there was no doubt that in several states there was some shenanigans on uh, voter fraud, the kinds of very common things in Chicago particularly, right? And uh, there was what we had today, a, a vote counting of the electors, right? Which is a very procedural process, nobody ever. And uh, Nixon was in the well of the Senate, right? And uh, the, the 12th Amendment of the United States uh, requires a joint session in Congress to open all the certificates and count them. Right? And it's a very, it's a, it's, it's a session loaded with a lot of pageantry, people bring in, you know, they bring in the ballots in a special box. and. And uh, Nixon began the vote count because remember, he's as the vice president, he's president of the Senate, right? And when the tally was complete, Kennedy had received like 303 electoral votes, and Nixon 2019, and Harry Byrd 15. People forget that. But before joining the joint session, Nixon asked the speaker for permission to make a brief statement. And then he declared actually that his defeat, his opponent's victory, were an eloquent example of the stability of our constitutional system and of the proud tradition of the American people in developing, respecting, and honoring the institutions of self-government. Remember, this is one of the most vilified presidents other than Trump in American history. Yet, he had the good sense, the patriotic duty, and the, an, an understanding of his historic position in in, in you know, his, his historic position as a defeated candidate on what needed to be done to demonstrate the transition of power is to take place peacefully. Right? And in fact, Nixon, most people were quite surprised after they finished this huge count that goes on forever, the whole chamber actually uh, erupted in a prolonged ovation. And Mike Mansfield himself commented that uh, 
He had never seen anyone handle such a loss with such dignity and his head held high. So we can even take lessons from Richard Nixon. That's my, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the takeaway from this little story and why it's important for us to have leaders who understand, yes, we are kind of a tumultuous society. We have a lot of huge political differences, but we have to respect the institutions. That's all we have to hold on to. And so I am personally horrified by the breach of the Capitol. I just think this is just, this is just as bad as the riots. I mean, there's been no smashing of stores and stuff, but breaching the Capitol and engaging in this behavior is outrageous. And uh, I hope eventually these people will be prosecuted. So far, we're not pro we haven't been prosecuting anybody in Washington for various crimes against private property, but maybe now we will do so. You know, so. Yeah. One, one, one point to, uh, to mention, in the case of Nixon, maybe uh, he thought he saw into the future, thought later he would run again. And uh, the grace that he exhibited on that day in what, 1961 um, uh, paid him back. Uh, it served him well. Um, because if he had uh, done something less gracious, or worse yet, if he had done something along the lines that Trump has been doing, um, he, he, his chances of running again would have been seriously diminished. Yes, and I, I do think, I mean, I, I don't, we don't wanna to spend too much time on this. There is a group, a very substantial group of people in American society who feel alienated, that the system is not working for them, that the, that the acrim that it is expressing, I think the level, I've never seen this level of, uh, people have said this many times, but actually I think it's true. I've never seen this degree of political acrimony between the two parties in my, and I've been in Washington since the middle 1970s, and I've never seen anything like this. It's, it's just terrible. And, uh, I don't, I don't like a lot of the ideas that people come up on both sides of the aisle, but I, I'm used, I'm, you know, used to you know, debating these issues on their merits, uh, publishing, publishing documents, talking about them and discussing them and then take, taking your wounds and go home quietly. Don't, you know, that's just the way it works. Yeah. You can't always get your way. So do you think that uh, Trump's departure uh, will ameliorate that divisiveness. I think there's no doubt about that. And I also think, I mean, I don't know what some members of the Republican Party are up to. I, I, I'm not, I think they're making a huge mistake, but there's going to be a sort of come to Jesus sort of set of meetings in the coming couple of years. And I think there will, in, in many ways, this event today might purge the party of this uh, kind of uh, control Trump seems to have as a kingmaker. I mean, look, he is responsible for the loss in Georgia. He is responsible. He has to, you know, he handled that completely wrong. Well, I, he's been special uh, in his own right, but he has also um, fomented all kinds of unrest and incompetence uh, throughout the government. Um, and I, I don't know if the ordinary schmo reacts the way I do, but I'll tell you this. Um, you know, there have been times in my life when I have voted for Republican candidates, um, but I will never, I'm telling you now on the record, I will never vote for another Republican candidate as long as I live after what happened in, in the Trump period. You don't have to worry in Hawaii, no Republican candidate will ever win. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> not with my vote ever. <laughs> and not any national no, candidates I, I, either. <laughs> I, actually, I, I do think this is something to think about because I can actually point to a, a half dozen, a dozen things Trump did that were actually very good for many of the people who are viewed, who maybe detest him the most. Here's a, a Justice reform, particularly for Black Americans, was an amazing achievement. It was a recognition, and and the justice reform and the and the and the opportunity for lots of people who were put in jail for long terms for drug offenses and stuff. Uh, he, he should be given credit for that, and many Black Americans do give him credit for that. 
Well, I, I give him credit it's for uh, the, the reform on the pardon in the pardon department. Uh, he, ha he has given uh, obvious criminals uh, pardons. And I, I'd like to suggest that uh, he's going to do more of that before he's finished here. And so to the extent that he has demonstrated incompetence and uh, what, what will I say, uh, a complete, uh, complete violation of all the norms in so many other areas, I must say, Lou, I don't give him credit for anything. If he did anything that had a beneficial effect, it was a mistake. It was, it was uh, accidental. Uh, yeah, so I do think uh, there were many things having to do with, uh, you know, the tax reform, the... Uh, the uh, that was a justice. really bad bill. Well, that just depends on your perspective. You have to look at the uh, the economic growth we got out of that. Then there is uh, the uh, support for historically black colleges. The point is, is that all these presidents, even the worst of them, there are things they do that are positive. There are things they do that uh, the regulatory reform, I would say there's a half dozen areas at least in which he had a positive contribution. But these were overwhelmed in my opinion by his inability to take advice, his sort of narcissistic behavior and his complete uh, ignorance and uh, maybe not ignorance, but discrediting of all the traditional political norms that makes a complex system like the US work. That's my, I'm not a, I'm not a, I don't suffer from Trump derangement syndrome. I don't, I see him as who he is, but I do believe that the damage he has done is substantial. I do, I do believe that. It's incalculable, Lou. We're going to be paying a price for decades for the things he has done. He was the worst president this country has ever seen by far, by multiples and eons far. And uh, to the extent that anything he ever did worked, it was, in my view, it was uh, completely accidental or coincidental. Certain difference. But, you know, I, th I think, you know, we're, we're, he's not going to rank high. I don't know if he's the worst, but he, he'll be close to it. I think it, but it's almost all style. You know, it's almost all style and uh, abuse of the institution, you see. You know, I was with a bunch of Europeans right after Trump was elected, and they were just, I was chairing a pretty big session in Germany, in uh, outside of Frankfurt and Cronenberg. And the Germans were just beside themselves. And I said, look, America has great institutions. And we have had all kinds of presidents and we've gotten through it. And I think we're gonna see here where we'll get through it again. And we are gonna get through it. It's going to be, we're gonna have a new president um, probably won't take the press more than a couple of months before they decide they don't like him, but <laughs> and uh, we're going to, you know, we're going to have, uh, but I think we're going to move more towards reg what we call regular order in Washington, which is we have a process, we go through it, we debate it, uh, things are decided, uh, people fight about it in the press and they go home and try to, you know, throw the new guy in. It's a, it's a whole conversation, but I, yeah. but I, you know, I think that we've lost our way on a number of levels. And maybe, just maybe, uh, you know, Biden can do better. But the problem with Congress, the problem with the president is that everybody's interested in ingratiating himself. Uh, Trump was only, a, you know, a symptom of that. I, and and um, McConnell was only a symptom. We've been doing it for a long time where self-interest rules. And I think well, we've got I, to go back I, to I, Mr. Smith goes to Washington uh, with the, the sole notion of, of serving the country and the people. So I would suggest your listeners read uh, Majority Leader McConnell's uh, speech today, which was very much in keeping with the Nixon tradition about this transfer of power, complete repudiation of what Trump was trying to do and adherence to the importance of our democratic institutions. So. I don't blank, you know, these people are, you need to think these people are political animals. They're politicians and you can't, don't fall in love with them, but they're not as bad as we think they are. They're never as good as people say they are, but they're never really as bad as we think, right? They, they, they are balancing a lot of interest from their own constituencies, from their own political bases. And uh, out of that comes a, 
comes a, a unique sort of American solution to a lot of problems. Well, I, you know, I, I haven't uh, seen the speech from McConnell, but I'll assume, and I will, I'll take a look at it, but I, but, but I, I will see it. Um, let, me, let me add though, that even assuming it was the most beautiful, um, you know, patriotic, uh, kindly statement of uh, high principles, uh, I would add that it is much too little and much too late because he has been sucking up to Trump the whole time. He has done horrible, horrendous things for as long as they've been together. And I give him no credit at all for some, some uh, you know, fancy high-minded words at the very end. Much too little, much too late. He's a bum. Yeah, well, I mean, it just depends. You know, I guess I've been in Washington too long, but I have a very complex view of these guys on both sides of the aisle. And I would rarely make that kind of judgment on any of them. And uh, except perhaps Trump, <laughs> you know, in this sense, you know, I, I just think it's, you know, it is the nature of American politics in many ways. And, uh, and you know, when I tell, even I tell this to my kids, look, let's, He's just the president. It's not like these guys your father or somebody who should be remotely important in your life. Don't, don't personalize politics. Don't personalize all this stuff. It's too, it'll, make, it'll give you an ulcer, right? You're in control of your own life. These guys are not controlling your life. Well, let me, let, me, uh, let me say that my conclusion and the conclusion of some of the others who speak on think tech has been that um, you know, sooner or later, one way or the other, the combination of uh, Trump and McConnell will, will get us. They will come to us, they will visit us, they will make us suffer. Now, <laughs> some, and some people have already had that experience. Other people have not. Other people don't like to think about it. But I, I would like to ask you that question, you know, in three months or six months or nine months into the Biden administration and ask you what you think about the long shadow that they have cast across our future and see if your answer is still the same. Let me say, I've had plenty of criticisms of Trump and I will have plenty of criticisms of Biden, but I will not have the same personal opinion of Biden, okay? I believe that Biden will engage in a lot of wacky ideas, but I believe deep down he is a decent person. Okay? He is a decent man. Yeah. <laughs> I'm convinced he will promulgate a series of wacky policies. And by the way, I have not seen any president not do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to have to continue our discussions on this yeah, point. Yeah. No, but and, and, cool. and, and, and I hope you remember this discussion so I can hold you to it, all right? <laughs> I don't have to worry. Who's ever president, they're going to do stuff that just because they're going to do it. Okay, let's go to our case in chief, Lou. So let's our our go case in the, chief has to do with the elections in Georgia. So, as you know, last night in Georgia, uh, and actually I was quite surprised. They, they I, I realized that they lost one of the Senate seats. As you know, there was a runoff election for both the six-year term and also a replacement term, right? And the two, uh, uh, all the candidates in my view were sort of weak. I don't know, this guy Ossoff has never done anything that I can tell in his whole career. And uh, Warnock had a kind of checkered history as a kind of fiery, uh, a firebrand pastor. But I think Purdue and Loeffler were not that strong candidates either. In any case, the Democrats won. They now have, we now have a Senate starting on January 20th, which will have 50 Democrats and 50 Republicans. And in that particular system, the vice president, which is Kamala Harris, will be able to break the tie. This means that uh, Charles Chuck Schumer from New York, who's very much concerned about a primary challenging challenge from uh, AOC, uh, Miss uh, uh, Cortez, Ocasio Cortez. Uh, will become the new speaker of the, the new majority leader of the Senate, excuse me. Um, and uh, the, all the committee chairs will be uh, chaired by Democrats. That's the Energy Committee and the Environment Committee. 
Now the Senate has a lot of peculiar rules. And, and the question is how will that play out in this new session? And I think we've identified four things that this election means in terms of en energy and environment policy. One, there's probably going to be less room between the two parties for energy policy consensus, right? There's going to be- I mean, less likely they're going to reach th consensus. There's less stuff they're gonna agree on, right? Mm -hmm. Then, um, you know, Democrats, I mean, you know, the Democrats might not uh, forgive or forget objections in the past, but, and, uh, but basically, the, the acrimony and partnership is not, and, and partisanship is just not going away. In fact, I've never seen the acrimony as far as. Second, when it comes to green fuels in 2022, uh, the Democrats will probably have an upper hand, right? And if you think about it, McConnell, so McConnell will lose his chair and the, and what, what we're gonna have is a very, thin Republican minority, and it could serve a check on their green agenda for on one place only. Senator Manchin from West Virginia is not going to vote for wacko green ideas. Okay. He's from West Virginia. People depend on coal and oil and gas in West Virginia. And so everything that happens is going to require all 51 Democrats to vote for the provision. Right? Now, with, there is something in US law under the International Emergency Economic Powers Act and the Energy Policy and Conference Conservation Act and other provisions held by the president in which he could declare a climate emergency under the National Emergencies Act. So Biden could try to supersede a lot of the traditional legislative powers of the Senate and, and, and by executive order declare an emergencies act. But actually, and this, uh, you know, we did this in the Korean War where we uh, intervened in energy production and manufacturing under the Defense Production Act. So I think Biden has this authority. He could, he could execute it. Well, with, with the authority under the, what is it, emerge, a Climate Emergency Act, what, well, what authority no does he have? Well, there's no Climate Emergency Act. He would, to, he would have to pull, use other legislation, the International Emergency Economics Powers Act or the Energy Policy and Conservation Act or, uh, you know, the Outer Continental Shells Act. He could try to halt U.S. oil production in some parts of the country. My personal view is, that Biden is too centrist to invoke these kind of far-reaching presidential emergency powers. And uh, he will not use this to advance his climate agenda. In addition, if you look at the people he's selected, they're not really bomb-throwing radicals, right? Uh, former EPA agency administrator, Gina McCarthy, who's the sort of domestic uh, climate czar, she's a kind of, you know, traditional technician rather than a uh, progressive politician like uh, Washington State government and climate hawk Jay Inslee, who wanted that job, right? And so I think here we're going to see a lot of um, movement on the margin. I think we're going to see a push for more electric cars. But Biden's also going to be very sensitive to the issue. Oh, if you have a, if you ban electric cars and you try to do that, what happens to people that can't afford electric cars right? because they're too expensive? They're going to have to address, I don't, it's, it's hard for me to think that Biden will not be sensitive to it. And then the other issue that's very important, I think, is the filibuster, right? Now, for people in the audience that don't know about this, uh, the filibuster is really a, a, leg a parliamentary, a legislative mechanism that requires de facto 60 votes, right? essentially a Senate supermajority for most laws, not all, all, not all laws, right? It was broken by Harry Reid, the former Democratic majority leader, and further broken by McConnell for the Senate, for the Supreme Court. Uh, so what the interesting thing about this is both Senators Manchin and Bernie Sanders are Senate institutionalists and they wanna keep the filibuster. 
So I, I, I'm not really thinking that they're going to break the filibuster to make the U.S., Puerto Rico, and the Solomon Islands uh, states. I just don't see that happening. Probably, and I think, and probably takes a constitutional amendment for the District of Columbia. And the other interesting thing about all this is that someone like Manchin, who's kind of a swing vote. And people say, well, maybe he should just switch to the Republican Party, but I don't think Manchin will do that because he is sitting in the most important catbird seat in the Senate. If they want to do anything, they're going to have to work it out with Joe Manchin. And I don't think he's ever, ever experienced such a tension. So, so as we go, we go forward for this and, you know, and we are, this acrimony hasn't gone away. There, there's uh, you could see lots of things happening. In fact, uh, you might see a national clean energy standard. It's a viable thing. You might see multi-billion, billion-dollar uh, transition accelerating stimulus spending on renewables and electric vehicles. So we are going to be entering a really interesting period in the energy transition and the U.S. role in that. Well, from what, from what you say, I gather that um, we can say that um, 50 Republicans and 50 Democrats with a, a Democratic um, what president of the Senate in the form of Kamala Harris, that, that should give the Democrats the edge. But you cannot assume that the Democrats will all vote for a given initiative. So it's, it's not as simple as saying they're all Democrats plus Kamala Harris will vote for everything that comes up from the Democrats. No, but they uh, definitely do the procedural things, right? The committee chairman and all these things. So I think, but you're, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And at one level, maybe they can take this lemon and make lemonade out of it. <laughs> by Because uh, there are lots of uh, Republicans that are interested in climate, maybe not the same level, the same approach, different tactics. and. Perhaps they can put some grand bargains together, get to, to get on the gradient, so to speak, and, and make some progress in important areas. So, re respecting that Biden has, um, you know, kind of a mandate because he's promised it um, to go green, at least to some extent. Um, and there are people in in um, you know the, the Congress who want him to do that, and you know are uh, criticizing him for not doing it enough in his appointments. Recognizing all that, what? And recognizing the problem we just described with the 50-50 Senate, what's your advice to him about how he should conduct himself in terms of you know, maintaining the relationships um, and also effectuating good policy? So I think there is a consensus in the US and among the, you know, there's a lot of high wind states that are run by Republicans. People forget that, right? That, you have no trouble to getting the uh, Midwestern agricultural states to vote for wind subsidies. It's not a problem at all because a lot of wind blows there, right? So these politicians, all politics are local. And they, they, they do that. And so they, they go ahead and uh, these things are very much likely to be opportunities for compromise and consensus. And if, you, if I were Biden, I would spend some time thinking about, well, how should I think about America's energy security? The vast swath of oil and gas producers in Pennsylvania, Texas, Oklahoma, uh, West Virginia, uh, you know, New Mexico. What, what should I do to not be too punitive for them so they can continue to be a major supplier to the world oil market? At the same time, get cooperation from them to accelerate uh, renewable strategies in the power sector and other parts of the U.S. economy. So I suspect Biden is quite capable of figuring that out, uh, whether he can cobble together a kind of compromise here. Um, it, it certainly is not outside his DNA. He was in the Senate for 40 years. He's got to understand what needs to be done. Well, would you agree with me that we live in different times now? Those 40 years are interesting, but not necessarily dispositive. We live in times when climate change is all the more threatening. We live in times when there's a generation of people coming up now who are going to, or who are insisting on, on um, dealing with climate change. 
Um, and, and finally, you know, you describe a, a country where everybody is out for protecting the interests of his jurisdiction. And of course, that's, you know, up till now the American way. But if you look at the world in general, if you look at the country in general, we really have to do something about energy um, so that we don't make climate change worse. Now, I grant you there are reasons to, you know, be careful about that, not to undermine our economy. But, but what about the notion of let's try to protect the country in general from the ravages of climate change? Let's try to protect the world and be a world leader in climate change. And although you know, we don't necessarily have to cut out all the fossil fuels, we should take you know, deliberate steps to reduce them. I mean, wouldn't that work? Uh, well, in principle, it sounds like a reasonable approach, but the devil's in the details. There's a lot of, and it's certainly something we can talk about in a future show. You know, what, what are the elements of this uh, energy transition that makes sense for us? It's a global problem. Uh, what we do is, frankly, particularly on the local level, is not going to have a very big effect unless China, India, and the major uh, economies in the Indo-Pacific region decide they want to do it. I mean, just think about it. When you talk to people, they talk about climate. They talk about energy. People forget about steel. You can't make anything without steel. All the wood in your fake background there needs a steel saw or a steel, uh, some device to extrude plastic. Well, it takes 100 tons of iron ore plus a highly dense energy source to produce 100 tons of steel. Well, what's going to happen in India and China? They have enormous requirements for steel if they're gonna to continue to grow. And so, yes, I agree with you. And we need, to, we need to get on the gradient and do this, but we need a system that is less wishful and more thoughtful. Okay. Well, <clears throat> the thing is that today and now, uh, these are historic times. To the Georgia runoff elections, that's historic. We could have been stuck with Mitch McConnell for another, another four, that would have been something bad. Um, and then, you know, Trump uh, lost the election, uh, although he struggles and strains against that and organizes these skinheads to come and bust up the Capitol. The fact is they're out of the Capitol. They demonstrated who they are. And I guess the, the police and whatever police forces were in Washington have demonstrated they had the ability to get, get them out of the Capitol. So, one of our so, it's a, so it's a historic day, Lou. Yes. And I want to ask one last question of sure. you. What is your advice? What is your reaction? Why is it historic? What does it mean? What message do you want to leave with our viewers on this special day? So I would say... One thing to remember about, first, your politics is very messy, but remember, we actually do have great institutions in the United States. And people don't like the outcomes of the courts often, amazing, but we do have, and we have accomplished amazing things. Uh, and if you can go through life seeing everything, and I, I'm not a Pollyanna person, but the notion that this country, and I, I forget about Trump, the notion that, this country, the, the military, our scientists, produced a vaccine in nine months. I can't think of anything more American than that. Right? I can't think of anything more American than that. Take a look at the number of bombers and fighter aircraft we, we made during World War II. I didn't think we still had that in us. The fact that we did this in nine months is an enormous achievement. And I understand everybody's been kind of coddled and complaining and nothing works, and, but this is an achievement. And you don't even have to give Trump credit for it. Give all the scientists at the FDA, the NIH, the researchers, the army, the army itself, which is handling the logistics. It's something all Americans should be very proud of. And that's the message for the new year. We are still a country with enormous innovative capacity. And we can take that innovative capacity and use it in a lot of different ways. Thank you, Lou. Lou Pugliarisi, a, a, a fitting message on the new year. Happy new year to, Lou, to you, year. Lou. I look forward to more of our discussions going forward in these very interesting and challenging times. <laughs> Aloha. Aloha.